uh, fine words that she gave because I'm going to try and talk about transportation from the beginning of time up to the future. Now that covers a lot of territory. <laughs> so, uh, a little bit, John. I want to make sure you get. There you go. I hope you're comfortable. Can I get it, John? That might be too high. Is that all right, everybody here? All right. Let's start out the beginning of time. When man first came on Earth, the only way he had to get from where he was to where he wanted to go was to walk. Today, people still walk. We go from walking until the next stage was the point where man was able to take an animal and get it to the point where he could ride on it. We're talking about horses and mules and donkeys and jackasses and camels and elephants, all kinds of things. That took the load off of him, and he was able to get from point A to point B without walking. Let's jump ahead a few hundred years, and we come to the next stage, and it would be the wheel. The wheel was very important because it enabled man to carry something other than on the back of an animal or on his own back. The wheel came into being with the Roman chariot and with a single axle sulky. Then it involved into a two axle vehicle which became a wagon, which became a stagecoach, which became all kinds of things. But the only thing missing was a road. They didn't have any roads. <laughs> going to have a little competition. <laughs> He'll whistle a little bit more before he goes by, so we'll just kind of let him go and have the stage for a minute. But until he... <laughs> you planned this, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Two more times. <laughs> duty. All right. The, uh, the problem with, with transportation in the early days was roads. There was just no way to get anywhere. Until the Romans came along, the Romans knew how to build roads because there are Roman roads that are over a thousand years old that people are still using. I have pictures of Roman bridges that are a thousand years old that people are still using. Today we build a bridge and we feel very good if the thing lasts for 10 or 15 years. So uh, we have a lot to learn yet. Let's jump ahead another 100 or so years and come to America now. In the early days, the 1600s, the 1700s, the time of the Continental Congress, most of the people that went there, they rode a horse. They didn't use a, a buggy or a stagecoach because the roads were bad. They just, in the summertime, it was dusty. In the wintertime, you couldn't use them. And if it rained, they had mud up to the axles. They wouldn't work. Much of the commerce was done on the ocean. Uh, they had boats that ran from uh, New York to Philadelphia, New York to uh, Boston, and all of that. Carried all of the commerce. And now, let's jump another hundred or so years, come right up to where we're standing right here today. This was part of what was known as the Connecticut Western Reserve. And Ohio was all messed up because after the uh, uh, East Coast was settled, Ohio was claimed partially by Virginia. West Virginia was a part of Virginia at that time. Virginia claimed part of it. Connecticut claimed part of it. They said, well, our line for Connecticut goes from the top of our state to the bottom of the state. Those two lines go clear across to the Mississippi River. Well, there were people that contested that. Uh, New York contested it and won. And Pennsylvania contested it and won. So that part was taken away from Connecticut. But the part that was left was known as what was reserved for the state of Connecticut, and it became the Connecticut Western Reserve, and that's where we are. The southern line was just a few miles south of here. Connecticut then 
sold the land off. There's people like Olmsted bought it in chunks, like 9,000 acres for less than a dollar an acre. He then in turn turned it over to the Connecticut Western Reserve Company, which sold it off to individuals. The surveying done here was, in Ohio, it's probably the worst of any place because part of it is the old meets and bounds system. Most states sold it off in blocks six miles square. Ohio was five miles square. So that hmm. made the lines different. There are deviation and variation in the compasses, and you can see that one is corrected. If you go across old 224, you'll notice that you'll go for about 25 or 30 miles, and all of a sudden the road dead ends. And you turn 100 feet north and make another 90 degree, and you take off west again. Well, that's where they corrected the errors in the original surveys. And you'll find that on a lot of the roads in Ohio. When the thing stops, jumps over 100 feet, takes off again, that's a correction and a survey. They sold it peculiar ways. Uh, 640 acres is a section. They divided that into quarters. A half of it would be, uh, what, 360 and then 160, and divided that into quarters and sold a lot of it off in 160-acre segments. And the people that come in here to claim their territory, they really had a problem because they had to walk. There was no way to get there. There were no roads. There were no buses or anything. They had to walk. It took them six weeks to walk in here, bringing the family. The man would carry a rifle and his axe, and the woman would carry her bedroll, a Dutch oven, and a frying pan. Now, that's all she had to cook with. And they're coming in here, and they're setting up building a cabin, setting up a housekeeping, and uh, that's, that's all they had. There's no stores, there was no place to go to buy anything, <laughs> and life was not great. They'd put up a cabin and call in all the neighbors, and the neighbors now would be one man from Streetsboro, one person from Hudson, one from Deerfield, one from Warren, but somehow the word got out and they'd all come in, chop the trees down and put the cabins up. Five logs high, thatch roof because there was no way to make shingles or anything. They had a fireplace that was made out of field stone and clay. That's where you had to cook and that was also <laughs> where you got your heat that didn't provide much heat. You had a place cut for a window but no window. Usually you hung a deer skin over that because there's no glass here. You had a door that was usually a bear skin or a buffalo skin. There were still a few buffalo around here in the, we're talking now the late 1700s and early 1800s, or a buffalo skin would hang down. That would be the way you kept the, the place warm. It didn't stay very warm. The roof leaked, miserable, but that's what these people had to put up with. So what happened next? This Governor DeWitt Clinton up in New York, they called it Clinton's Folly, he dug a canal from the uh, Buffalo to Albany, New York, and it was an instant success. And all of the commerce from the northern part of Ohio and the other Great Lakes went across the Great Lakes to Buffalo, across the Erie Canal, down the Hudson River, and into New York, and then it was sent up and down the coast by boat. They had these uh, coastal schooners that did that. So then the people in Ohio started to call on their legislators. We were now a state. 1803 it became a state. The capital was in Chillicothe. So they said, hey, you know, we need one of those canals too. We're stuck here in the middle and we have nothing. And it's your job now to provide us with a, ca a canal. So typical of uh, Politicians, it took them two or three or four years to get the paperwork done, and they did decide to build two canals, not one. One from Cleveland to Portsmouth. It was uh, Cleveland to Akron, and then down to Maslin, and over to Coshocton, and then Newark, and then down to Portsmouth. And the other one was from Toledo to uh, Cincinnati. These people could work. Uh, many of the ones that worked on the canal were Irish, and they, for some reason, were able to work in these bogs and everything 
without getting what they call bog fever, which was probably malaria in our term today. But they uh, dug this canal by hand from Cleveland to Akron in two years. They started in 1825, and the first boat ran in 1827. Two years. They cut all the stone, built all the locks, built these big gates out of white oak, and the canal was running in two years. And then by 1831, it was done all the way to Portsmouth. Immediate success again. They now were able to bring things in and ship things out. If they grew wheat here, it was no value because everybody had wheat. What are you going to do with it? You can't sell it to somebody that has their own wheat trying to sell. It's worth 10 cents a bushel. When they're able to ship it over the canal to where the market was in New York, it was worth a dollar a bushel. Then Philadelphia got upset because New York was getting all of this trade. So Philadelphia said, we've got to build a canal across the middle here to take that commerce out of the middle and bring it into Philadelphia. So they pushed for what was called the Pennsylvania Mainline Canal. And it was marginally successful, but it was a real combination of things. It used the Dug Canal, it used the Susquehanna River, it used inclined plains, it used railroads, it used tunnels, and eventually got to Pittsburgh. But it was a, a tough haul. The boats were made in three sections and bolted together so they could unbolt them and put them on these little carts that they hauled up the inclined plane to get to the top where it was put on a railroad car and hauled for a ways, then put down another plane and put back together and hauled to Pittsburgh. So it was a real problem. But it worked. And then to get into Ohio here, they put the Pennsylvania and Ohio Canal to meet with one of the Pennsylvania mainline canals that ran from the Ohio River to Erie, Pennsylvania. And this canal started at Akron in the lower basin behind Goodrich, went right down the middle of Main Street in Akron. And that's why Main Street is so wide in Akron. There was a road on either side of the canal, and the canal ran down the middle. So today, Akron has a real wide Main Street because the canal, canal's still there. It's in a culvert underneath. <laughs> Then it went to uh, up through the falls, through Kent here, and uh, on to Ravenna and Youngstown, and hooked up at Newcastle, Pennsylvania, just south of Newcastle, with one of the Pennsylvania mainline canals. Now this was the thing that really opened up this country right here, where you're sitting right today. Now the lady could get glass to put in her window. She could get uh, a wood planks because one of the things the uh, canal boats brought in was equipment for sawmill. They could saw boards. They could have a wooden floor in their cabin. They could have a roof over their cabin. And best of all, she could have a cast iron stove. This stove you could cook on and it provided heat. So the place was beginning to really look alive now. The waterfall through Kent is the thing that made the village. And uh, there were grain mills, sawmills, hammer mills, all kinds of things along here, all brought in by the canal. Well, the next step then, in the 1850s, this is where the railroads come in. So some of you are waiting for railroads. We're going to talk a little bit about railroads. The railroad came in. And uh, the first one was from uh, Cleveland to Pittsburgh, although it didn't go all the way. It went to a river town. You had to get on a riverboat and go up the river to Pittsburgh. And that's another thing. At this time, there were 2,500 riverboats, stern wheelers, on the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Kentucky, the Tennessee River. You could have, if you had $2,500, you could have a boat built. And you could go into business, and they called it a trade. In other words, you could say, well, I'm going to have my boat, and I'm going to run from uh, Portsmouth to uh, Pittsburgh. I'm going to be in the Portsmouth to Pittsburgh trade. And you could advertise, I'm going to leave every Monday and Wednesday for Pittsburgh and come back on Tuesday and Thursday. And you hauled everything. You hauled people, you hauled cattle, you hauled anything that was to be hauled, you hauled on these boats. 
And this was a great means of getting around from point A to point B on these boats. And incidentally, that business lasted until right into World War II. For example, Kroger Grocery and Baking Company, headquartered in Cincinnati, they served all of the, boat, the cities up and down the river by boat yeah, until not too long ago. Uh, cities like uh, Wheeling and we Weirton and Wellsville and Portsmouth along the river. All right, let's get back to the railroad coming in here. The first railroad, as I said, came down, didn't hit Kent, went through Earlville. And the railroad at Earlville was not where it is today. It was up on top where Vaughn's Market was. It was at the north end of Vaughn's Market. It crossed right there behind those houses on the first street to the left. Went right across the golf course. Still there. You can see where it went. They use it to go in there now with their mowing equipment and everything. But you can see where the railroad was. It was relocated at a later date and double tracked. Well, Mr. Kent was very upset because uh, he thought the railroad ought to come to Kent. So he, uh, in order to get anywhere, you had to get out what they called a heretic stage, which would haul you up to Earlville. And uh, you got the train then, you could go either to Cleveland or Pittsburgh. But Mr. Kent then started buying up small railroads in New York, one of which was the Atlantic and Great Western. There were several different uh, names that they had. And uh, he finally put them all together, got the railroad into Kent here, and then it went on to uh, Akron, and from there it went down to Dayton, and at Dayton there was a railroad already that went from Dayton to St. Louis. And these were six-foot gauge railroads. That's six foot between the track, where a standard railroad, the one you see today, is four foot eight and a half inches. And uh, they figured this was good because the tracks were wider and the cabs were wider. The engineers liked it because you had more room in the, in the uh, locomotive and they could haul wider goods. The problem was you could not interchange with other railroads. When you wanted something that went to a city where your railroad didn't go, you had to take it off of this car, put it on a car for the railroad that went there because the cars could not be interchanged because of the difference in the wheel gauge. So uh, that's the way it started out anyway. Two years after the railroad came to Kent, Mr. Kent, who was president of the railroad, brought these shops to Kent. And this was the biggest thing that happened in this town. The uh, shops were right here where you're sitting. This is one of the original ones. The picture on the front of the uh, little brochure you have shows this area, this building in it, and it showed that in the summertime they did a lot of the work outside. They worked right here where you are. Put these cars together. Initially it started out, they had right over here, they had a roundhouse with a turntable and they did work on locomotives too. This only lasted two years and that part of it was moved to Marion. Mr. Kent then had a thing in the deed that if they ever quit using it for railroad purposes, the land would revert to him, so he sued the company. This went into court, and after pondering it for a while, the judge said, well, you can't do that. He says, you're the president of the railroad, you're suing yourself. <laughs> so that didn't go very far. But uh, the railroad employed as many as 800 people. And there were not 800 people in Kent looking for work. So what they did, and all of the railroads did this, I'll deviate a little bit. The railroads, for example, the Northern Pacific, when they built from Chicago to Seattle in the north, they couldn't get enough business just hauling it all across the country. They had to populate this place in between. So they sent agents over to the old country and they actually enticed them to come over here. They paid their way, and they sold them land. This was land-grant railroad. Remember, every alternate sections all the way across the country belonged to the railroad. So the railroad sold their sections off to these people they brought here, and they tried to match the people they brought 
with the area where they were bringing them to. It's cold, they have winters in Minnesota and Montana and North Dakota, so they went to the Danish, Danish company. They brought in Danes, Finns, Swedes. That's why in Minnesota there's a lot of Swedes up there. The railroad brought them there. In the center of the country, they did much the same. Germans were brought here, Ames, Iowa, and northern Texas, places like Mason and Fredericksburg, solid German. They were all brought there by the railroad. So now, back to our story. They needed people to work, so they needed some people that were in an area similar to what they had here. So where did they go? They went to northern Italy and Poland. And that's why there were just hundreds of Polish and Italian people that were here working in these shops. Now, what else do we need? Remember, we have to walk to work. Had to have a place for them to live. So the whole south end of town, Elm and Oak and all these streets, was all built right after or concurrent with these shops because these people had to have a place to live and it had to be a place where they could walk to work. So the whole south end of town is a result of these shops being here. Along with that, had to have grocery stores, bought every other block had a grocery store, had taverns, had uh, shoemakers, we had everything that comes with it. And that all was part of this. So along with the 800 that worked here, there were many, many more. They had a lot of children. They had to build a South School. That's why South School came into the picture, because uh, they needed a school for these children. So th this was quite a successful operation. Long about the 70s or 80s, more competition, <laughs> they, they started building the, the yards up above town. Now the yards are totally different from a shop. A shop is where you either built something, maintained something, or repaired something. The yards was where you switched cars because a train would come in from Cleveland, the second four cars were going to go to Pittsburgh and the next one go, and they'd break them up. Even during the Depression, they were running four switch engines up here in this yard. It was a busy yard. A lot of the people, the shops were kind of going down at the same time, but a lot of the people from the shops went to work up in the yards. They had things, for example, that you don't need today. They had a job called a car knocker, and what they did, they would walk the entire length of the train with a hammer, a bucket of dope, and some rags. And what they did, every single wheel, they wang it with the hammer and the thing would ring out if it was good. If it had a crack or a break in it, it would be a flat sound and he'd ride it up, pull that car out of the train. He had a, a hook on a rod that he'd pick up each of these doors over the, the uh, wheel housing and look and make sure that there was dope in it. Dope was just grease and rags, and the axle sat so that these rags were up against it and lubricated it constantly. And that's the lubrication they had. Those were called friction bearings. If the thing went dry, the friction would cause it to heat up and set the rags on fire, and that's a hot box. And that's why you needed a caboose with a conductor and a brakeman back there because one of his jobs was to stick his head out the window and look. If it was on fire, he could see it. If it was just smoldering, he could smell it. And they stopped the train before they had an accident. So the yards was a, a big thing at the time. The Connaughton Valley Railroad came in shortly after the year he did, and the Connaughton Valley is now the Wheeling. And it was an odd gauge railroad too. It was a narrow gauge railroad, only three feet wide, 36 inches. They couldn't interchange with the Erie and they couldn't interchange with any other railroad either. Eventually, both of the railroads in one day had 3,000 men 
on the area here, in one day, they moved that rail in so it was four foot eight and a half inches and they were like the rest of the railroads. That meant they had to change all the cars, the trucks on all the cars and all the engines and everything. So it was quite a, a deal. I don't usually tell stories when I talk, but I did read a, one that I'm sure most of you old rail people all know, but some of the rest of you don't. This had to do with the salesman that left New York and uh, he was uh, on a night train, he on a Pullman, and incidentally all Pullman conductors were called George. I don't know why, but they were. He said, George, said, I have a very important meeting tomorrow in Syracuse. And he said, I want you to make sure you get me off the train because he said, I'm a very heavy sleeper and when I wake up I'm nasty sometimes and I get awfully, he says, no matter what I say or anything, you get me off that train in Syracuse. Come the next morning, he wakes up and he's in Cleveland. So he says, George, he says, what happened? He says, you're supposed to get me off in Syracuse. He says, I'm, I'm upset, I'm mad. And George says, well, he says, I made a mistake. He says, but you may be mad, but you're not near as mad as the fellow I put off in Syracuse. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's, that's a railroad story, so I can tell it. Uh, the shops here shut down in 1930 for all practical purposes. Uh, part of it burned down, part of it was torn down. If any of you have stories or knowledge about these shops, there isn't a, much, a lot of information about these shops. For example, the building that was on the back end of this one, you have pictures of it there. It was a building perpendicular to this. It was two and a half stories high. What did they do on the second floor? Uh, there isn't that much need for engineering. Uh, if it was a paint shop, it certainly it wouldn't carry everything upstairs to paint it. We really don't know. Uh, and there are other buildings that we don't know what they were for. This building here uh, is one of the oldest buildings in the whole complex, and of course the building here. I want you to notice the, the work, stonework. Every little nick and chip you see in this is a result of a chipple, chipping hammer and one of those wooden mallets that they hammered away there. And look at the way those things are dressed. It's all by hand. And it's done so perfectly that you can hardly uh, get your finger in between those uh, things when they're chopped up. These, this was done by German. Masons, the same people that built the locks in the canal, that built the Plum Creek culvert, that built the dam up here, and that built the lock up here. Same, same people. German stonemasons. The uh, canal stopped in 1868. The last boat went through. 1870 was the end of the uh, canal era and uh, it was kept active for water purposes for a few years from the summit in Ravenna over to Akron. But uh, the people didn't like it. They said it was a smelly old ditch and made mosquitoes and all that business, so they kept digging holes in it. And finally, uh, they, they let it go. Now we're at the point where the railroads were at their peak in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, the railroads were at their zenith because there was no better way to get any place than, uh, don't want to go too long, uh, than uh, on the railroad. The railroads had dining cars that had white tablecloths, stoneware, dinnerware to use that had the logo of the railroad on it, heavy silverware to use. And all the cooking was done in a thing about three feet wide and eight feet long on a charcoal stove. But those guys made the best restaurant you've ever found. It was on those trains. The B&O was uh, famous for its Long Island duck. The uh, Northern Pacific for its Idaho potatoes. The Union Pacific for Rocky Mountain trout. Mm -hmm. And it was just a wonderful way to travel. But it took you five days to go from New York to the West Coast. So at this time then, 
the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Santa Fe Railroad, and the Ford Motor Company got together and they started the first long distance air line. It was called TAT, Transcontinental Air Transport. And the way it worked was this. Remember, it took five days by train. You get onto a train in New York, have dinner in the diner, go to bed, wake up, have breakfast, and you'd be in Fort Columbus, Ohio. You'd go off the train, go through the terminal, there'd be a Ford Tri-Motor sitting there. You'd hop on the Ford Tri-Motor, they'd land at uh, uh, Indianapolis and Springfield and Kansas City, and at night they'd land in the evening at Waynoka, Oklahoma. Waynoka, Oklahoma is a small town, smaller than Kent. They have a station a little bigger than Kent because it was also a division point, and it was the point where you did all this transferring. So there you got onto a Santa Fe train, you had your dinner in the diner, you went to bed, uh, got up in the morning, had breakfast, and you found yourself in Clovis, New Mexico. In Clovis, New Mexico, there'd be three Model T Ford station wagons to take you to the airport. You'd get on another Ford tri-motor and you'd land at uh, a couple places in uh, New Mexico and on across Arizona and that evening you'd be in San Francisco. So now you made it in 48 hours if everything worked out, <laughs> which it seldom did because the Ford Tri-Motor had no navigation equipment, it had no radio, any of the, the fly, it had needle ball and airspeed, that was all. They couldn't fly in rain, they couldn't fly in snow, they couldn't fly in fog. So if they come to that, they turn around and they land in a cornfield beside the railroad and the, the steward, no stewardess, the steward would get off and he'd flag the next train down and everybody get on the train and you'd take off. One guy, a wag, had gone all the way to the west coast by train and was all the way back all to Kansas City and he asked if maybe they couldn't just get off and go to the airport so they could see an airplane. But uh, that, that's the way that worked. The, uh, and then, of course, you know what happened after that. The DC-3 came along. It had better instrumentation. It could fly at night. Oh, the next step was the blue and the green and the red airways. And these were set up, for example, some of you may have seen this. One of the airways was from Cleveland to Columbus, and it followed right down Route 42. And they had every 10 miles, there was a tower, like a windmill tower, and on top there's a rotating beacon, white on both sides. If there was an airport or an auxiliary field there, it was white on one side and green on the other. That told the pilot that there's a place he could get down. If it was night and he had to land, he'd buzz the field, and the guy that was the attendant there would run out and he'd put these flare pots along to bring him in. And incidentally, we used flare pots yet in World War II for training. I've landed a lot of B-25s with flare pots. But uh, that it did allow them to fly at night. You could go along and you could see these things. Every 10 miles, you could see one, five or six of them out there, 50 or 60 miles. So that was the next step. And you know what airline traffic is today. So, so where are we going to go now? We're, we're nearing the end. Where are we going to go now? What's next? Well, automobile traffic is pretty well as far as it's going to go, in my opinion, because those of you that drive a lot, you go into Cleveland or Columbus or Cincinnati or any of the big cities at 4.30 in the afternoon, you're not going to go very far. You're going to sit there. Uh, you go five miles an hour and you move a few feet and go on. So adding another lane to I-71 isn't going to solve that problem. The airlines, certain days you can sit and look up there and you'll see 15 different vapor trails crossing there. The air, the air is getting pretty crowded too. And if you're flying, and I hate it now because you go and you have to be there an hour and a half early and they box you in this little tube and there's people as far as you can see and you wonder how in the world is this thing going to get off the ground but it does so so where are we going you're not going into space because it 
costs a couple million dollars and hundreds of thousands of gallons of highly volatile fuel just to kick one of these things up into the air. And you're certainly not going to do that to take 25 people from here to London. It just isn't practical. When we get a better power plant to boot this thing up into the space, you're going to probably have space travel. The thing that's most likely to happen now there's a, a thing called maglev trains. It isn't really a train. It's like a railroad car, and it sits in sort of a trough. And you know how magnets, one way you put them, they push each other away. You can't even get them to touch each other. And the other way, they smack in. Well, what happens in the bottom of this vehicle, there's a magnet built, and there's a magnet built into the track. It's an electromagnet. When they energize it, it lifts the whole car up about two inches, so it's literally floating on air. There are no wheels. Then there's another magnet in the bottom of the car, and there's a magnet in this, I say track, but it isn't a track because it's just like a trough. That energizes and attracts this, so it pulls the thing forward, but just before it gets there, the computer moves it to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, it's like the carrot in front of the horse. <laughs> and the thing goes faster and faster, experimentally, They've got them up to 600 miles an hour. So now you're on the ground. Anything happens, you just settle back. You're still on the ground. It's unlikely that anybody's going to terrorize the thing because you can't take it and run into a building or anything. It's right there on a uh, private right-of-way. China already has one working. It's working at about 250-some-odd miles an hour. France has one that's working. So I look to see more of that. We are working on it, but you know we work on a lot of things, but we don't fund it then, and it just doesn't happen. Uh, a lot of these cities now are going back to, and I missed a lot of things. I don't want to keep you here all night, but you know Kent had the Twin Coach Company. And that was one of the largest bus companies. They have twin coach buses in Chicago and New York and Philadelphia and all of the big cities. That was a big operation. Kent had an interurban line that connected Akron and uh, Kent Ravenna Alliance and uh, Warren. So we've had almost every kind of transportation. They're going back to interurban or streetcar. It's called light rail now. They have it. Cleveland, of course, has the rapid transit, but they've got it in Pittsburgh. They've got it in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, St. Louis, uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, Denver. Denver follows I-25 right down there, and you have six and seven car trains filled with people, and every one of those trains takes about 200 passenger cars off the road. So maybe that's the answer to the, the, the in close. So where are we going to go? I don't know, but uh, it's going to be an interesting time. And I'm going to quit now because I think we've gone long enough. How about questions? Anybody? You mentioned the Plum, the Plum Street culvert. Right. Was that built for the canal? Yes. At that level, the canal was up at that level? Yes. The Plum Creek culvert he asked about is right down here uh, behind where Allen Drain is. The best way to get to it now is just park in the park over here, go down to the new path, walking bike path that goes down over the hill, walk around this disposal plant on the bridge that they've built, go across the bridge that's across the river, and 100 feet, there's the Plum Creek culvert. It's built by these same people that built this building, and... Uh, it's a marvelous thing, 160 years, and it's just like the day it was built. I'm trying to get the park department to clean the place out so you can get down in there and see it. They've dumped a lot of trees and junk on it now, and it's almost impossible to get down there, but it's really something to see. And it's, it's there, and the canal went in the top of it, went over the top, the canal and the towpath, and the Plum Creek went underneath. It's truly a culvert, not an aqueduct. You mentioned that uh, when the shops were built that there were a number of stores 
that uh, were built to service the people. Were these company owned like uh, no. the mines did or privately no, owned? No, these were privately owned and a lot of those stores lasted until uh, not too many years ago. Uh, Ferreras just closed not too long ago and there was one right up here on this corner. And there's one at the corner of uh, School and uh, Franklin all through here. They, they, these were privately owned stores. And uh, they did their own butchering, a lot of them. And, uh, they were just grocery stores. They were butcher shops. So what else? Was this building built in 1865? Say it again. Was this building built in 1865? Yes. That's what's on around yeah. front. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lucky I said yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the shops were built in 1865. It, uh, I mean, it's remarkable that they would build shops out of stone. It's just that the stone was here, and, you know, I could go on forever. The stone, it's right underneath there. This is all stone. The people on this side of town had a heck of a time with water because you couldn't dig a well here. There was a big spring, and I have yet to find it, but it was between Summit Street and the Nut and Bolt factory. That would put it right here, a big spring that served a lot of the people in this part of town. There was another big spring right where the telephone company parking lot is at uh, Columbus Street and Deep Oyster. There was a big spring there. There was another spring on the left side of the river from Crane Avenue going up. If you know where Dorothy Allen lives up there now, uh, there was a spring on their property and there was a spring right at Grant Street. The canal boats incidentally got all their drinking water from these springs because they had a barrel. They carried canal uh, water into drink. The rest of the time, they swam, they uh, dumped their buckets into the canal, they washed their clothes and everything else using canal water, but they didn't drink it. <laughs> so. Is it regrettable? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, why it went out of business because with the forming of uh, of uh, Conrail. Conrail had three railroads. All of them sort of went the same place. In other words, New York Central was up around the uh, Cleveland area, the Pennsylvania was south of us, and the Erie went right down the middle. And it kind of went no place. It, went, it didn't go to any big cities. It went to Akron. But it didn't hit Buffalo, and it didn't hit Pittsburgh, and it didn't hit any. So they said, well, we can't operate three railroads all going to the same place. So the one most likely to do away with would be the Erie. So that's how they did away with the Erie. Of jobs. Lots of jobs were lost. Although at that time the shops had already closed. The shops closed in 1930. But, uh, okay. Wasn't the upper yard still being used in the 1950s? Oh yeah, the upper yards were used tapering off. They were used, the roundhouse wasn't used anymore. But the yards were still used, but in the 1950s they were running through trains. In other words, they'd go right through the yards. They changed crews. In fact, they changed crews at Crane Avenue. I used to laugh because they never stopped, really. They'd slow down to a crawl, and the guys that were on there would go to the back and get off on the back steps, and the new crew would climb on the front, and they'd take off again without ever stopping, which I think, Bob, is against the rules, but that's, <laughs> that's the way they did it. And, and yes, uh, you can still go to the upper yard. You can see the foundation for the roundhouse. The foundation is there for the uh, water tower. There was a swinging bridge, which I have your picture of, going across uh, right there. It was a rickety thing. There was a, a a boarding house across the river called Jack's Boarding House. It wasn't very good. They served food and bed, but they claimed the bed bugs and all were big enough they walk off with things. <laughs> <laughs> the building is still there. It is now an apartment house, and it's been gussied up. It looks pretty nice. John, do you have any uh, favorite recollections of the interurban? Oh, lots. Uh, <laughs> 
my favorite wood wouldn't be this in urban. Uh, I like the Lakeshore Electric, and I like the Cleveland Columbus and Southwestern, and I like the Eastern Ohio Attraction. But uh, I recall going to Painesville in 1925 on the Interurban for a family reunion. And that was one of the things, I guess, that got me interested in things. I've been fiddling around with it ever since. Is the Clinchfield Railroad still in operation down in Tennessee? I don't know. Anybody know Clinchfield still operating? Part of CSX. Yeah, it's probably not under Clinchfield name. It's part of CSX, Bob Rohall says. Yes, I have a uh, question about uh, a couple of the dates on this insert okay. in the program. <laughs> you say that the last passenger train went through Kent on January 5th, 1970, and the last steam train operated through Kent in February 52. Do those dates pertain to the Erie? Because I believe the uh, the B and O had steam until about 1960, and technically the last passenger train through Kent would have probably been. The Capital Limited before they uh, Amtrak rerouted it yeah, but sometime it, in the 90s. It was only running with one car. Right. <laughs> An engine and one car. I have a picture of that. But I can't answer your question exactly. The Erie, I think, was 1950, wasn't it? The last passenger train? January 7th. The January date for 70 is correct for the Erie. It is? Okay. For steam. But the B&O did have steam after the Erie, yes, because uh, they had steam operating out of Willard. I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank the Myers people for letting us have this here. There are some uh, drinks back here. Too, because we have and, a little more program. Uh, and I want to also thank the Jacobs for the work they did on these pictures. I mean, Great. they went to a lot of work for that. And, you know, this is volunteer business I'm talking about. So uh, I'll uh, turn this back to our slave driver here. And... <laughs> well, young man, you did very well. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we really, really want to thank John. Uh, let's have another hand for John. <laughs>